Oh, yay. Oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 21-5269, Larry Elliott Clayman, a balance, versus Naomi Rao, the Honorable et al. Mr. Clayman for the balance, Mr. Sauter for the appellees. Good morning. Um, our panel consists um, today of Judge Sack, Judge Erickson, and myself. We're sitting by inter-circuit assignment. Um, we're very grateful for all the assistance of the clerk's office, and we are very grateful that you have given us your presence today. Um, since the case has already been called, uh, Mr. Clayman, you can proceed um, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honors. It's my honor to appear in front of you, and may it please the court. This case presents a very important and exceptional situation. What do you do when the DC Circuit Court does not review the record and overlooks intentionally, regrettably, because it became very controversial in terms of the lower court judges, overlooks major errors of law? At some point, would you explain the, the intentional part? I understand everything you're saying, but at some point, if you'll explain to us the argument that is intentional I've had, rather than bad. Yeah, uh, regrettably, Your Honor, I've had a very contentious relationship with Judge Coley and Color Catelli over the years. It spans many, many years. We probably don't have enough time to get into it. I moved to disqualify her on a number of occasions, and I have no personal animus towards her. But this case took 16 years to litigate, and that tells you something. And the judges of the panel of the D.C. Circuit found this to be commendable. And that tells you something. Now, Mr. I'm asking. I, I do want to let you make your argument. But since you, you mentioned multiple efforts to recuse her, can you get is it is it easy for you to give a record site to any example of her impartiality that you would point to that's extrinsic to her rulings against you? Yes, Your Honor. The very fact that she let in, uh, as we talk about in the briefs, issues dealing with alleged wife beating, uh, sexual harassment, had nothing to do with this case. Latecki, you know, the famous Supreme Court case, says that if legal errors are so grave and so extreme, that that can give rise to an inference of extrajudicial bias. But let me get to the, the crux of the argument here, because I'm asking for perspective relief. What I'm asking for and under Pullum, there's no immunity in that regard. I'm sure your honors have read that carefully. I'm asking for this case to be, the judgment to be vacated, to go back to the DC circuit so they can review the record. They never reviewed the record. There are major errors here, not just with regard to the prejudice in terms of in injecting this inflammatory uh, material uh, allegation, which has never been proven. They didn't bring the woman in here that I allegedly sexually harassed they didn't bring my wife in there, nothing, former wife. And but you have major errors with regard to trademark infringement. The, the law of the D.C. Circuit itself says you have to have appreciable number of consumers that are confused to give rise. Clement, if I could ask again, um, these are therefore, as I understand it, you agree. These are errors that Mr. Simkovitz, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, did particularize in his brief to the D.C. Circuit. But your contention is. They just didn't pay attention to that. In other they words, there are, no, there are no errors in the trial that you're pointing to that you hadn't already pointed to the D.C. Circuit? I put all the errors in front of them, and it's clear they didn't review the records. Yes, what I'm asking know. for, what I'm asking for, Your Honor, I was denied due process. I'm asking for you under Rule 60 to order them. And you can order them on the basis of any other reason justifying relief from operation of the judgment, as well as mistake, inadvertence, surprise, or excusable neglect. I'm asking prospectively to go back and order them to thoroughly review the record. They didn't do it. The very fact that they come out with a statement that a 16-year administration of the case is commendable tells you they're protecting a fellow jurist. This, this, this is, is human little, nature. If I may say so, go, go ahead, Judge Eric. Go ahead, Judge Sack. Uh, no, I was just going to say this is a little strange because you're talking, I'm sorry, you're talking about 
uh, sending it uh, uh, back to the D.C. Circuit, what makes it strange is for the present purposes, aren't we the D.C. Circuit? Well, you are. And, and consequently, you can make the ruling. That's what I was saying, is that we need to have a review here. And I thank God and I thank you for, for your independent review of this matter, because, you know, we're all human beings. OK, if if my law firm was accused of something or whatever, I mean, we would have the tendency to circle the wagons. And that's why I am very, very grateful that your honors have this case, because you can't do it objectively. You just can't. And look at Judge Cooper, who dismissed the action sua sponte before it was even served. I never had a chance to even respond. And I got this order. So I'm just asking for due process. There's no personal animus towards anybody here. But we're dealing here with a two point eight million dollar judgment that if it's allowed to be enforced by simply rubber stamping what the lower court did will bankrupt me, my family and hurt me. And this is inappropriate. And, and the, the biggest issue here, notwithstanding the trademark issue or the issue of, of not even providing adequate notice of what the jury instructions written wise were given to the jury or, or other issues that I outline in here, which are serious issues, is the fact that, you know, I was accused of wife beating. I mean, even in a criminal case that can't come in, let alone a civil case, the parole evidence rule, I signed a severance agreement with Judicial Watch, which said I left on good terms, they praised me. Yet I got sandbagged with this and it was allowed in front of the jury. It was highly inflammatory. And all of these things were overlooked. In fact, there was no discussion in the DC Circuit's rulings of the parole evidence rule. You can't go outside of the scope of the contract. <clears throat> were, were these issues raised in your uh, petition for cert? You know, because, you know, kind of the ordinary course is, you know, you, you have a three judge panel, you petition for rehearing on bank, you file your petition for, re, uh, for, for cert, and if they grant it, fine. If they don't, it dies, right? I mean, and so I'm not aware of any case in which a, a, a subsequent three judge panel gets to revisit um, the previous holdings of the court without running into all kinds of problems with the uh, issue preclusion, right? And so um, I, I'm wondering- There's, there's no issue. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Your Honor. My apologies. Uh, there's no issue preclusion here because the issue of the D.C. Circuit not reviewing this matter has never been litigated. That's what we're here on today. We're not talking about what happened uh, before the lower court. It's the D.C. Circuit not doing its job. In fact, when they denied it. I understand Judge Erickson's question is, you, did you make that argument as to the panel's delinquency when you filed your en banc petition and when you filed your cert petition. I did, Your Honor. But as Your Honor is aware that the Supreme Court takes very, very few cases, they actually had, you know, very important cases on their docket dealing with Roe v. Wade. It's discretionary. And that is not demonstrative of the legal duty of Your Honors in all due respect to address this issue, because this issue had been filed long before I filed a cert petition. What I'm right, asking the issue, the issue before us is the correctness of Judge Cooper's dismissal. And so I, I want to give you the opportunity before your time runs out to actually respond to the threshold jurisdictional case law cited by the government. And I want to draw your attention particularly to the Supreme Court Celotex decision and to the DC Circuit's small decision. Those both stand for the proposition that Judge Cooper has no authority to review the DC Circuit's ruling. So how do you, could you respond to those two cases specifically? Because I didn't see it in your reply brief. I don't read those cases that way, Your Honor. I just don't. And in fact, we're in front of you right now. You do have the authority. And well, but, but I'm just gonna interrupt you because you need to respond. If you don't read them that way, how do you read them? Because those are binding on us and the DC Circuit cited them originally and now the government side them. Mm -hmm. So I really need to know how you read them differently. Number one, uh, we pled all that we needed to plead under notice pleading requirement under Rule 9. Okay, but I'm not, I'm not getting to the, to the plausibility of your claims. So I'm asking, what's yes. your authority that Judge That's Cooper could review a decision that you took on direct appeal all the way en banc to cert? What, how do we avoid those two cases? So speak to those two cases. Because this is, this is an exceptional case. In order to get up in front of you, I had to go there first. 
And consequently, Judge Cooper, by denying or dismissing my case, actually created the predicate to be in front of you. So now I'm in front of you. I'm in a superior court right now. That's how I got there. I couldn't file directly in front of you. I tried to do that with the petition for rehearing on Bonk. It was dismissed with a huge record of 16 years in 11 days. That's simply not plausible. So put as concisely as possible, what is the reversible error that Judge Cooper committed when he stated he didn't have jurisdiction to give you the relief, vacature and new trial that you're asking? What is, what is, where is the reversible error in that jurisdictional holding of his? Reversible error is uh, that he should have referred the matter uh, to a higher authority at that point. But I had to start there, Your Honor. I had to start there and I tried. In what front process exists under the rules for a district judge to just refer a matter to the Court of Appeals. I was a district judge for a long time. I would have wanted to do that from time to time, but I, I didn't, didn't know right. any way I could. I was going to start this hearing by asking you a question. Okay. <laughs> what would you do under these circumstances? It is so unique. It is so unbelievable that a, 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 a circuit court could write that this was commendable the way this case was handled. I mean, it's beyond the pale. It's beyond imagination. And that's why I implore you to actually read the record as well. Because if I need to go another route, I can go another route. But I had no other route to go at this time. And Rule 60 seemed to cover it. I'm not seeking to relitigate other cases. This is a unique case dealing with the D.C. Circuit's failure to provide me Fifth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment due process rights. Where else do I go? As far as the Supreme Court's concerned, that's discretionary. They're not going to be giving much time to Larry Clayman on a discretionary matter when they're dealing with Roe v. Wade and issues like that. So you're my last hope. You're my last recourse here. And I had to start with, with, with Cooper to get up to you, but I never had an opportunity to even brief the issue in front of him. I was denied due process there as well. I've never seen a situation like this where before I even served the complaint, he's writing an order. So, you know, there obviously is something going on there. And we know, and, and you all are not from Washington, D.C. We know the atmosphere in Washington, D.C. today. I'm the founder of Judicial Watch. I'm the founder of Freedom Watch. Uh, it's highly toxic on both sides of the political aisle. And Larry Clayman has been, over the years, you know, a thorn in the side of the establishment. And I wrote a book, which was very critical of the judges on that court, because I've been practicing there for 45 years, nearly. So, and, and Mr. Clayman, your answer, I mean, we have read this record of course, um, and you gave us voluminous record excerpts. And so I'm looking at your page 241, there's your en banc rehearing. And you did make this argument that the panel had overlooked your arguments. So that was not to the Supreme Court, but to the DC circuit en banc. And I take it your response would be the same that they too overlooked everything. The Supreme Court? No, the DC circuit. Bon. Yes, bon. yes, they did. They did, Your Honor, because look, everybody, <laughs> We know, we know, you know, what what the situation is here. People in the same courthouse, judges like everybody else, you know, go to lunch together. They socialize together. They talk about litigants. They talk about what's going on, their impressions of them. They didn't want to be bothered with this. And so they just rubber stamped it. But how can as a matter of justice, a situation occur where someone smeared for beating his wife that has nothing to do with the case where they ignore their own case law, which in, in the in the D.C. Circuit that says you have to have appreciable number of consumers confused to give rise to trademark infringement, and that's where most of this the huge ultimate community. question. And I, I, I hate to take your time to ask with my mind. The ultimate question is, who are we to do something about that? You have Rule sixty as a, as a vehicle to do that. Because this is, it falls in, in particular, number six, any other reason justifying relief from operation of a judgment. What I'm saying is vacate the judgment and order them to do a review. Order them to do their job. Or if you can do the review, if it stays in front of you, and I trust it will, take a look at the law here. Take a look at the facts. This thing is, frankly, on Mars, what, what came down. And, and then I don't get a review. Would you, Your Honor, write that it was commendable to administer to a case for 16 years? That tells you something. Commendable? Are you kidding me? So this is where we are. And, and the government, 
just so you know, and you'll have rebuttal time, but the government has cited law just for the proposition that we don't have equity authority when you had a remedy at law. And your answer would be that the remedy of law was just illusory? My answer is, is that I was never provided due process. Therefore, I was never provided a remedy at law. Yeah, I was completely denied due process. I think we are into his. Oh, I apologize. Time. Yeah, so we're going to have Raymond. to somehow. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have yeah. to, I think, give him an additional uh, several yes. minutes. After I, I, I've been told that, Mr. Clayman, you will get two extra minutes added on for a rebuttal because Thank we you, did. Mara. I kept asking questions. Thank you. So we'll hear from the government now. Thank you, Judge Sack. Mr. Soder, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. Kevin Soder from the Department of Justice for the defendants. The district court properly dismissed this lawsuit for a simple reason. Litigants who are dissatisfied with the results in their cases cannot resort to suing the judges. In a thoroughly reasoned decision, the district court relied on four independent doctrinal bases in support of that common sense conclusion, this will be Judge including- Cooper. This, will be Cooper. this will be Judge Cooper. Yes, Judge yeah. Cooper. Um, issued the, the thorough decision that's available in the appendix that details these four doctrinal bases to support the conclusion that a litigant dis disappointed with the results cannot sue the judges. Uh, this court should affirm for the reasons that we've set forth in our brief. I think we've laid out uh, the various options this court has for affirming, and I'm happy to address any questions if the court has them. Well, when you say he did list out four, um, some are jurisdictional and some not. So I assume you'd agree we would, we would start with the jurisdictional ones. Um, and I saw at least two, which, which of those would you say have current and controlling DC circuit law to support them? Because judicial immunity seems to be a little bit more of a murky world. I think this court could certainly begin where we began in our brief with the jurisdictional issue, whether a district court has jurisdiction to vacate the orders of another federal court. Uh, that it follows directly from uh, the Supreme Court's decision in seal effects that Your Honor was discussing, as well as the D.C. Circuit's decision in Smalls, that there is no such jurisdiction, and that is an ample basis for affirming the result here. Uh, to the extent the court continues on, I think everything past that is sort of an additional basis confirming uh, this result on multiple other grounds, including immunity, issue preclusion, and merits. Um, um, well, you, 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 you do point out that Pulliam has complexities and the, and your brief suggested even infirmities. Um, you want to elaborate a little on that? Yes. I think as an initial matter for the reasons we've discussed, it's not necessary to get into these details of what exactly the scope of Pulliam is because of this threshold jurisdictional issue to the extent the court goes on to reach alternative bases for affirming that result. Um, I think there are a few distinctions from Pulliam that are important to keep in mind. One is that Pulliam only involved a claim for truly prospective, injunctive, equitable relief. This case doesn't. This case involves a request to go back and retrospectively review the results reached in prior litigation. Um, and then the, the other key distinction that's been discussed by the 9th, 11th, and 3rd circuits is that Pulliam was a case involving uh, state judges, state judicial officials, and there are just different considerations at play. The reasoning of Pulliam doesn't extend in the same way when you're dealing with federal judges for whom, again, sort of tying back to the general theme, there are avenues to obtain the sort of relief that Mr. Clayman has asked for here, a vacater of a judgment, but those are to go through the orderly process of an appeal to seek reconsideration in the district court, the court of appeals, all of this that already happened. Um, and the process has to come to an end at some point and it ended uh, already in this case. Now, Mr. Clayman Pro Se is asking, particularly, repeatedly, suggesting the fair there was no fair trial, above all because of what we could call 404B evidence, and and in particular, you know, uh, the the alleged assaultive behavior. Do you want to speak to whether or not that would that specific issue, the correctness of the introduction of that evidence? This is assuming, just for the sake of argument, that we would get to uh, the claims. Um, was that never considered um, either in district court or in circuit court? I think uh, that was clearly considered in the DC Circuit's decision. 
And as Your Honor uh, mentioned, these issues were raised in the, in the briefing to the D.C. Circuit um, and in the en banc briefing, and there was also a cert petition that was recently denied. These are all the sorts of issues that can be raised in litigation and on appeal and that, in fact, were raised here. And there is no authority to support bringing a collateral lawsuit against the judges asking for a do-over of those sorts of decisions and trying to inject these claims of, um, of bias and, and improper judicial decision-making. There is an, an orderly process that already happened here. I, I, I'm curious, okay. just, yeah, go ahead, Judge Jackson. I was just uh, contemplating, is there an, is some other orderly process for this? And, I, and I'm wondering, you know, uh, a court superior to the D.C. Court of Appeals, uh, which would be, by definition, only the Supreme Court of the United States, couldn't you petition for a writ of mandamus um, directing? I mean, if you really did have evidence, I mean, and the problem here is we've got, you know, perhaps part of the problem is the, we have, of course, only a complaint. It's conclusory. There was never anything developed above that. Um, and there's no evidence uh, other than, you know, arguments that, that, that are inferential, right? Um, and so, but the Supreme Court would have the authority to issue a writ of mandamus to the, to the DC circuit actually to just say, you know, we find that you didn't actually review the case and we order you to do it, right? Or am I wrong? Yes, Your Honor. I think the important point is there are uh, processes at law, there are what would be adequate remedies at law, which include appeal in addition to a writ of mandamus if the mm -hmm. uh, circumstances warrant it. What there isn't, and what the case law makes completely clear, is there isn't an opportunity to bring a separate collateral lawsuit where you go before a different district judge and ask that district judge to order vacater of an existing final judgment. Um, I'm just curious a little on a slightly side issue, but it was an issue decided below and therefore before us. Um, if, in fact, all judges on a circuit are recused, um, what is the government's you have multiple arguments against the authority to transfer. Um, and I wasn't exactly sure which was your primary, that factually there would be no other venue with jurisdiction over the defendant judges, or that transfer itself is, a, is an issue that's been decided and therefore there's race judicata even as to that issue. I think the, there are several grounds on which this court could uh, affirm the, the decision about disqualification or transfer. Um, perhaps the, the one at the core of it that may be most straightforward is to just agree with what Judge Cooper said about why he did not need to uh, recuse himself from this case, which was the core of Mr. Clayman's allegation of, for transfer there. And that was fully consistent with the uh, ethics opinion that's been issued by uh, the relevant committee of the Judicial Conference that we cited in our brief. Um, I believe that's um, at page 29 of our brief. Uh, there's a citation to the opinion that says that when you have this sort of case where someone tries to sue the judges and it's not a, it's not a claim with merit, um, there is no conflict for, um, the, the, for a district judge to be sitting on that, even though it's accusing that judge's colleagues of um, misconduct and other issues. Um, in addition to that, there are other bases, including that this court can affirm for the reasons in part one of our brief. And this is not the sort of threshold issue that needs to be reached at all. Mr. Clayman is already- I want to be a brief being, rem remind me, you say part one of your brief, which refers to what issue? Uh, the correctness of the dismissal uh, rather than the um, just the sort of transfer or disqualification issue. Oh, got it. Think, okay, got it. Uh, it follows from, we cited the, the Supreme Court's Sinechem decision in our brief for uh, why this sort of issue about whether the judge needs to disqualify is, uh, yeah, something that the court needs to reach. Mr. Soder, Mr. Clayman has argued that, uh, um, that the, the, the process here uh, that was followed by Judge Cooper is somewhat unusual, that he ruled sua sponte. He ruled sua sponte before actual service of the complaint and any opportunity on the part of uh, the defendants to respond. Uh, and that uh, uh, the unusual nature of that is evidence of uh, bias or prejudice uh, such that uh, recusal really actually uh, is, is, is the appropriate remedy. How would you respond to that? I think, Your Honor, what's unusual in this case is the repeated uh, 
um, attempts to attack the same judgment through after going through all of the available actual processes to already collaterally attack it before uh, through the case that was before Judge Shutkin um, and to bring these claims that just do not have any basis in law to proceed with. And so in that circumstance, Judge uh, Cooper was acted well within his discretion uh, to resolve this case on threshold jurisdictional grounds that were incurable and also to rely on the DC Circuit's Baker case um, that we've mentioned in our brief that stands for the proposition that even a standard sort of merits 12b6 dismissal, when it's patently obvious from reading the complaint that that's warranted, a district court uh, has discretion to dismiss the case without notice to the plaintiff. Thank you. If there are no further questions, I am happy to rest on our briefs for the remaining points. Thank you very much, Mr. Soder. And Mr. Clayman, I apologize again for not paying attention to your rebuttal time. In our court, that's usually a frozen amount of time. Oh, why don't you go ahead and take two? I think you had <clears throat> two minutes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that. I just want to make it clear. I'm asking for perspective relief. So we do fall, fall within the scope of Pulliam. I'm asking that the D.C. Circuit be required and you can do it obviously now because you are the D.C. Circuit to review the record. OK, actually look at the record and see what happened. This is a manifest injustice and it, it behooves the court. So, to so that would be that earth. would be satisfactory. That would be satisfactory to you if we just say go back and look at the record uh, thoroughly. That as long as you're as answer. long as you're doing it. Yes, that would be satisfactory, Your Honor. Uh, the other thing is there's no distinction. Be, this is another point, but that's not the major point. There's no distinction between uh, federal and state judges in terms of immunity for equitable relief and power to, to grant it. Uh, that's just simply not in the cases. You won't find it. So, I mean, that's the bottom line is that we need to have due process here. This is an example that creates a very bad precedent for other litigants to come into the court in a day and age when people are already having, on both sides of the Pacific, uh, all sides of the political spectrum, concern about the functioning of our legal system, it's very important that the courts create that confidence for even someone like Larry Klayman, you know, who's been a public interest advocate, that he gets due process as well. So I thank you very much, you know, for your time. I'm very grateful that you're on the case. I ask that you review the record, take a look at it. There's got to be a way to skin the cat here because this just isn't right. I'm going to ask one last question, Mr. Clayman. What would be your limiting principle? Let's just assume any litigant who feels their case is just as important as yours feels that at every level of direct appeal, uh, their arguments weren't sufficiently considered. What would be the limiting principle that they couldn't always then allege bias, hostility, and demand to have uh, the courts just look at it again? How, how is, this, are you differently situated? This is that extraordinary case, Your Honor. And, and that's why I kept citing. I mean, look at the opinion itself, which, you know, praises Judge Catelli for 16 years of administration of the case. That was gratuitous. That didn't have to be put in there. It tells you where you're coming from. Or Judge Chutkin. But, but is that if we found if, if we were to find similar language, uh, which to, with uh, which we disagreed, calling something commendable when obviously it was not, that is the limiting principle in that. No, case, what I'm saying. This? Yeah. No, what I'm saying is this, this case is so extreme. It's the extreme case. And Judge Chuck, in another example, I asked whether there had been any communications with Judge Catelli. She she stayed the case pending appeal. She decided on her own against Sua Sponte to dismiss it before the appeal was even heard and withdrew her order to stay. There's something that went on over there. I'm, I'm just looking. The only thing I'm trying to be sure I understand is the answer. Uh, to Judge Higginson's question is to is to what are the what are the limitations? I understand your view and your position, but the question is in you know looking for a general rule of law. What is the general rule and of law it, we would take out of this? In most instances, Your Honor, it would not be subject to collateral attack. But this is that extreme circumstance, and you can see it right from the record. And oh. it is extreme when a lawyer, uh, without any proof is put in front of a jury because a defendant wants to create inflammable prejudicial material that he beat his wife. That's the worst thing that you can put in front of a jury. And we cited cases 
in that regard. And even a criminal defendant who's accused of violence, if it's not relevant to what he's being accused of, you can't do that. I was a civil plaintiff. So you're arguing essentially the limiting principle is if the case is uh, uh, sui generis and is in such a way uh, unto itself that it shocks the conscience that right. there's an exception. So this is a sort of shock the conscience kind of argument that we- Yes, yes, you know, it, yes, it is. And when you- the only way to limit it? Yes, and when you defy the own law, your, the law of your own circuit with regard to trademark infringement, and, and again, these consumers, were, the documents weren't even authenticated. We don't know that Judicial Watch didn't create them. They were never authenticated. And yet the DC circuit has ruled you need appreciable number of consumers to be confused but, about uh, trademark infringement. I, I, I would, I would I'd be most interested for you to specifically address yourself to Judge Erickson's question. Is that the is, is that the standard shocks the conscience? Is that what we're talking about? We're looking for a standard, a rule. Yeah, I, I, would, I, would say, I would say, I would say, he, he hit the nail on the head. This shocks thank the you. conscience. Thank you, and thank you, Ron. Right. Thank you both. We appreciate the arguments. The case is submitted. Thank you very much. This honorable court is now adjourned until Thursday, August twenty fifth, at nine thirty a.m.